So you'll remember that several, well, it's probably been over a year ago, we talked about the need for elders and eldership in the life of our church. And on a Wednesday night, you gave us the go-ahead to, to begin to study it in our bylaws. And so we have been doing that as a staff to work on it, to present it to you hopefully in the month of March. Uh, maybe get it out, did we say before then? Or maybe get it out before then, but look at it in our March quarterly meeting. Okay, no vote or anything then, but just to look at it. And so we're working in that regard uh, to do what you ask us to do. And then, it's probably been a year and a half ago, I preached a couple of sermons on elders and deacons. And I want to do that again, but uh, these are totally different. I didn't even look at what we did before, or I did before. So this is kind of new on biblical church leadership. So we'll talk about elders in two sermons, and then more than likely I'll do deacons in another. Doesn't mean they'll be sequential because I have, you'll be watching some kind of football game next Sunday night. You probably are not going to be concerned about elders, except to vote me out if I have church on that night, right? <laughs> and then, but, I, but I'll let you know ahead of time. I think there's another one in the month of February that I'll have uh, on the third Sunday night. And then there'll be one right at the first of March that will be on deacons. So just keep that in your mind. All right. Well, let's just study the word. This is a Bible study. You ready? All right. There are basically three words in the New Testament that relate to the office of elder. So what I'm presenting to you is to encourage you to see from Scripture that there are two offices in the church. Okay? Elder and deacon. So tonight, just on the elder part. The first word used is presbyteros. What does that sound like to y'all? Presbyterian, and you would be right. That's where they get the word Presbyterian. And it simply means elder. It's used 67 times in the New Testament. Out of the 67 times, 31 of them are in the strict Jewish context where it describes scribes and the elders or Pharisees and the elders. Four times... Maybe six, possible, that it is speaking of an older man. Okay, you know the text of scripture where, that deals with how we should teach and treat elder men. And that would be in reference to spiritual maturity and or being an older man. So the remaining 18 times the word presbyteros is used in the New Testament. That term has to do with a title of leadership that is in the church. So make your way to Acts 14. We'll go to numerous places, but Acts chapter 14. Here we have Paul and Barnabas. They're on their first missionary journey. And let's read together beginning in verse 21 of the book of Acts. Chapter 14, verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra... And to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, elders is plural, church is singular. Every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them. To the Lord in whom they had believed. <clears throat> so, this is the same exact construction that is used in the book of Titus. We will go there in a few moments. Or we will go back there. But just for the meantime, listen to Titus chapter 1, verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order... And appoint elders in every town as I, as I directed you. So as the New Testament church begins to unfold in the book of Acts, what we begin to see is that there is an office of leadership that is identified as an elder. So elders are appointed and the idea is that they would be the leadership 
in the church. I'm going to come back to that term in a little while. But for right now, know that that's kind of preliminary for us to understand what that particular word elder means. It is the word presbyteros. The second term is the word episkopos. What do y'all hear there? Episcopalian. And you would be right. That's where they get their terminology. Uh, I'd also let you know that Presbyterian and Episcopalian are two ways to describe church government. They take those words, Presbyteros, Episcopos, and they come up with their government. And those are denominational titles that derive from a particular view of church government. Episcopos is the term overseer. So when you see the term overseer in the Bible, that's the term. Epi is over. Skopos is to look. And so the, the, the thing is, the unfortunate part of this is when the KJV, original King James Version, translated this, it is translated, unfortunately, as bishop. And therefore, you know that creates some confusion, doesn't it? Over the years... But the term episkopos is used five times as a noun. One of those times is particularly only Christ, 1 Peter 2.25. And the other references are to the leaders in the church. So look over in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And we'll see the word. Acts 20, verse 17. This should be somewhat familiar to you. Since we've preached through Acts and most of Ephesians. Verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus. That's one church folks. And called who? Plural. Of the church to come to him. And when, he, when, they, had, when they came to him he said to them. Acts 20 is uh, a rich text of scripture for pastoral leadership. But for right now taking consideration... That that word, that they are brought over from Miletus, and they are called, he called the elders. And the terminology given to us there is episkopos, brought over elders. Again, uh, he called the elders, oh, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. He called the elders presbyteroi, that's the first term, right? And in verse 28, he says this. Here's our term. Be careful to give, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. There it is. They're brought over from Miletus to Miletus from Ephesus. They're identified as the ones. This is also really good for us to hear too. Identified as the ones the Holy Spirit had appointed as overseers. So two times the word is used as a verb. And it refers to the activity of an elder. Okay. That's the noun usage. Over in 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 2. The Bible says. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you exercising Oversight. <clears throat> so, the term exercising oversight is one Greek word. Okay? So, we've been introduced to two words used so far. Presbyteros and episkopos, which means elder and overseer. Okay? The third term is one you would probably be most familiar with. And it's the word poem. And it is the term shepherd or pastor. The word means Shepherd. It's used in the New Testament 17 times in the noun form, and 12 refer to Jesus, and four are actually real shepherds. Kind of like what we play in Back to Bethlehem, right? No laughing, no laughing about that? I mean, we're the legit real shepherds, right? <clears throat> but four of those are referred to as shepherds. Only one of those times refers to a Christian pastor of a church. Does anybody want to take a stab where that one's found? You should know this. Yes. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. Thump your Bible. It should spring there. Right? And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. 
That's the only time, only instance in the scripture where the noun poiemo or poiem is used. So, there the idea is the ones who shepherd the flock of God. It's used as a verb form a number of times. We, we saw a couple of them in Acts 20, verse 28. Shepherd the flock of God. And then 1 Peter 5, 2, we just saw that one. Give care to the flock. Shepherd the flock of God. So, in the New Testament, we have these three words. Elder, overseer, and pastor. So the conclusion is, when you examine the passages, is that all three of the terms refer not to three different people and three different offices, but to one person and one office. Okay? The one person who is an elder is the same person who is an overseer and is a pastor. It is the elder or elders, plural, that oversee and shepherd the flock of God. Some wrongly make a distinction between ruling elders and shepherding elders, and that comes out often in church polity. Whether you're Episcopalian, or Presbyterian, or Baptist. That's going to come out in the way you view that. The New Testament perspective is that all three of these titles and functions refer to the same office and the same person. So I don't believe the Bible teaches ruling elders. I believe the, the Bible teaches eldership and all of them are the same person with one office. Okay, I think that's clearly taught in the Bible. Acts 20 is one of the most compelling texts as far as I'm concerned. It is elders of the church, plural and singular church. So watch verse 28 again. <clears throat> that brings it together. Acts 20 verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. You notice that in chapter 20, all three are used. One in a verb form, right? Shepherd the flock of God. But all three of the functions are used right there together. So the idea here is that it is the elders who have been appointed as overseers who shepherd the flock of God. So again, we're trying to make the case that the church has two offices. We have the office of an elder. We have the office of a deacon. The function of the elder is to oversee and, and shepherd the flock of God. <clears throat> so, the term elder, presbyteros, has to do with the dignity or respect of the office. Elder is dealing with respect of the office. The term episkopos and our overseer and poem, pastor, refers to functions. Of the office. So the elder is the <clears throat> dignity of the office. The other two express more of the function of the office. Now those are the terms. Okay. What about the form? Well as we observe the New Testament. is actually a plurality of elders in each church. <clears throat> when you read the New Testament. When you read the book of Acts. You find a plurality. You can't find a church that doesn't have a plurality of elders. Okay? That's clear when we've just read through these. We saw it in Acts 14.23 where Paul appoints elders in each church. The idea is that each church would have a plurality of elders appointed there. Uh, another good text is 1 Timothy 5.17. More along the lines of the function. So Paul in this particular book is building on chapter 3 verse 15. Listen to this. If I delay you may know how you ought to behave in the household of God. Which is the church of the living God. A pillar and a buttress of truth. So he's building on this issue of church order. How should the household be designed. And when you get over to chapter uh, Five, verse 17, he's dealing with eldership as putting the church in, el in, in order, right? Listen to 517. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Did y'all put your eyes on that one? 1 Timothy 517. Let the elders who rule well 
be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Go over a few pages to Titus 1.5. You don't have to flip far. Again, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders. I mean, Paul is seeing eldership as something that puts the church in order. Are y'all seeing that? Turn over to James chapter 5, verse 14. James 5, 14. You will know this one. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders. Again, plural, plurality of the elders of the church. And let them pray over him. All right. You could also jot down Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Listen to this one. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. There's a verse that gives you both offices, plurality of overseers, but also the deacon body. So here's what we pick up clearly from the New Testament. There's the ideal, that the ideal is that there would be a plurality of elders in each church. So where you have a pastor... And might we say a board up under him is not a biblical model. In any form that that board functions under a pastor. And in Baptist life for years we thought, oh, that's the... We actually called it the deacon board. How dare we? Right? That's how bad off and skewed we were in Baptist life. Right? As if that board... Led the church. Made all the decisions. So there should be a plurality of elders in any given church. The solo or single elder structure is fraught with potential problems. Now I know I came here under that particular umbrella of a single led, a single elder led church. Or a solo led church as the pastor. Now I haven't treated my staff like that. Right? I'm smart enough to know that whether I get the title, I'm smart enough to know that whether you acknowledge the title or not, I know I have people in the church that are elders other than me. Okay? I don't even have to tell you that, right? We can just function because we know these things. Okay? There are tremendous benefits to a plurality of eldership and leadership. This is kind of a family meeting tonight, right? What would be some benefits? Can you name me one of them? Boom, that was number one on my list. Accountability. This is, a, this is so practical. It's a fundamental advantage uh, of plurality of leaders. There's not one single man who ends up being the pontiff in any given body. There's a group of men who bear the responsi uh, responsibility together. There are other benefits. There is iron sharpening iron. There is encouraging one another and even confronting one another. There is also the balance of strengths and weaknesses and gifts. We need some gentle shepherds on one side of the scale to offset me sometimes. Oh, no. I'm sweet as I can be all the time, aren't I, hon? Yeah. Uh, if we take it seriously, Acts 20, 28, these men are appointed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, who he makes overseers in God's sovereignty. He brings together a combination of people who have different strengths, different weaknesses and different gifts. And they complement each other. We complete each other in the sense of what God intends for leadership in the church to be. There are gifts, for instance, that Brother David has that I don't have. I have gifts that he doesn't have. There are, but they all work together, right? Around the eldership together. Again, sometimes one particular person is more, it, their gifts would be more appropriate to a certain task. We see that happen all the time in our church life. It all works together in shepherding the flock of God. It also keeps all of us real with each other. If we have to confess our sins, 
we do it, right? Accountability. There are no pre-Madonnas in a plurality of elders. Plurality demands parity and equality. No one gets two points for a vote on an elder leadership body. It's not that since I'm the lead pastor, I get two votes and you only get one, Jeffrey, right? Na 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 right? That's not the way it works. The encouragement and correction only happens with a plurality. And I'd submit to you that many of the tragedies of, that we have seen in SBC life and in Christian leadership across our land could have been prevented if there would have been genuine accountability that came through the vehicle of a plurality of elders. So even though the New Testament gives us a pattern of plurality of eldership, it also explicitly acknowledges that there may be some distinctions in the eldership regarding duties. Does that make sense? Not it. You can be an elder and not preach the load that I preach at this church 90% of the time, right? Or more. So look again. I think it is a crucial text in that regard to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Hear this one again. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially. Is that bringing a distinction or differentiation? Well, absolutely, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Again, even though there's a plurality with true equality, Paul would recognize that there, are, there may be some who are actually set apart to labor more regularly in the Word of God. There's a distinction that we would make. We could talk about full-time supported elders and, on the other hand, lay elders. Does that make sense? That's a distinction that would have to be given here. As, as we are now, as a staff, we have some full-time staff pastors. And when we do our bylaws, you'll, you'll, you're going to see this up front. There is, there is staff, you'll see a, a heading that says staff pastors. That doesn't always mean that everyone that is paid full time is necessarily an elder. You may not be. If you're a woman, you're not, right? But if you're, there's also a possibility that you could be hired at our church and a full time staff member, but not an elder. Does that make sense? Uh, I'll give an example. It's Don. Don told me up front when we began to talk about this. He said, Preacher, I am not an elder. He said, As a matter of fact, I'm a deacon. That's what I see myself as. And if you've been around Don a little bit, you'll know full well that that's what he is. So a distinction uh, that we could make, even among paid staff, is that not all of them are necessarily elders. What we're doing is trying to cipher that out, for lack of a better way of saying it. Uh, I've talked to all our guys to make sure that this is what God has called you to. Not that you feel pressured to say, oh, yes, I'm an elder. No, let's... Ask the question, do you meet the qualifications, number one, and do you have the call of God upon your life in this particular area? So it's vitally important, okay? So some are called to labor full-time in the shepherding of the flock, and they're supported financially, okay? So when we designate or when our church appoints lay elders, they will serve in the same kind of responsibilities, but the only difference is in the degree that they serve. I hope you understand that. In the plurality, there's equal recognition that there's, there is an elder that you should submit to and follow, whether it's your visible one you see up here preaching all the time, or whether it's a lay elder that the Holy Spirit has appointed that's been set apart for that particular vocation. So in terms of the preaching and teaching, I know, I get it. I end up doing most of it. But don't let that convey something that is not true. Okay? If I have 90% of the teaching and preaching responsibilities, that should merely be a reflection of strengths and giftedness, not a reflection on anything other than that. Y'all looking at me kind of strange. I hope you're getting that. What happens is that the one who is most visible ends up being the pastor. Right? Right? This is not the way it is. Many times people will begin to think that I'm the only one that can actually help you in this church. I got to see the, the visible pastor. 
And I don't mind that whatsoever. I mean, I, when I came, I said, I want to make all of the hospital visits to my people that I can possibly do. I just, I feel like I should do that, and I enjoy that. Now, COVID has made that somewhat difficult for me. You know, I, uh, you, gotta have to, you have to have a permanent mask, right? But we try to do that. But I'm wanting you to understand that I'm not the only one in this church that can help you. Neither am I the only one that's actually an elder. So, in other words, don't let the higher visibility give you false perceptions. Okay? Your lay elders will be just as much your shepherds as your staff pastors. That's the reason for a plurality of elders. They shepherd the flock of God. Acts 20, 28. 1 Peter 5, 2. What comes to mind... In the term shepherding. What comes to mind? How about protecting sheep? Yes. From what? Wolves. I saw it on some of your lips. What about feeding the sheep? By the way, in, in reference to that, I understand that there's only one senior pastor in this church. And he's the chief shepherd and his name is Jesus. That's why I'm not, I don't like the title senior pastor. That's Christ. Right? I'm a lead pastor, but I'm not the chief shepherd. Okay? All other elders in the church are referred to as under shepherds who are, in essence, sheep themselves. That would be me. That would be you. Everybody else. Sheep need, pro need protection, but they also need to be fed. They need to be guided. When we get a sketch of a sheep, we quick quickly realize that they're not the smartest in the animal kingdom. Sometimes I've wondered, Lord, why could you not have said, all you Labradors? Because they're happy? They're smart? Well, there's something in all of us that we, if we're honest, resembles sheep. And we could always say, Lord, why not a golden retriever? They're smart and happy. But sheep are defenseless. Are they not? I've never seen a sheep take down a coyote. I've never even seen a sheep rear back on its haunches and kick at, a, at anything to run it off. They are themselves vulnerable and they wander. They just go where the grass is and if that leads them off a cliff, then they're a big blob of fur at the bottom of that cliff. We know. This is the image that we have of God our Father taking, however, those ewes, ewe lambs and holding them in his arms in Isaiah 40. Shepherding the flock of God often involves restoration. It means going after the wandering ones. And how do we feed? We do it through the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. When it comes to guidance and leadership, it is just, it, is it just the will of the shepherds? I mean, can I just run off half cocked and say, this is what we're going to do? No, because what actually categorizes the leadership is you lead with a staff and a rod and we can't do that apart from the word of God so the only only leadership and shepherd model that a shepherd has according to the word of God is to lead you by the word of God right that's the only my authority comes only from this book not from anything I make up but what the scripture actually says so Shepherd also, shepherds also provide uh, an example to follow. Listen to Hebrews. Some of you have been after me to tell you the next book we're going to preach. And you're wanting me to do Hebrews. Many of you are. But I want to do an Old Testament book first. And some people have said, well, do a short book. <laughs> and others have encouraged me to do Deuteronomy, which is not short. So it may be a while, but Hebrews is probably going to be the next New Testament book for us. But listen to chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Well, that's a lot of words, isn't it? That's a huge responsibility upon elders. They look at them and their lives and they follow the example. Look at 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 1. I know we've been there before, but go back there. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. 
Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's the senior pastor, right? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see the, uh, that this is in way of an admonition to me. But it's also an admonition to those in this church that God may call as lay elders to serve in this church. You will be committed to being an example to others in this church. So, as we consider the functions of an elder, this debunks the idea that an elder board should be a collection of the church's most successful businessmen in the congregation who are business savvy and they know how to run an organization. I want to remind you, this is not first an organization. It is an organism that is alive. And do we need leadership qualities? You better believe it. But dare we function as a business? We won't. We function as a church. Warts and all, right? Difficulties and all. So what we need is men of spiritual quality. I'll preach that next time, right? Qualifications. We need men of ability who meet the qualifications and who have a heart to shepherd the flock of God and to oversee the flock of God and to feed the flock of God and to protect the flock. It takes getting our fingers in the wool of the sheep. We must serve as examples to the flock, according to the Bible. We need to take eldership very seriously. Word of caution. Let's not make the mistake of saying, here we have these two offices that need to be filled. Let's just fill them. Okay? We could act prematurely. Couldn't we, Brother BJ? We could put men in that are not actually called to the office or offices. If it is the Holy Spirit that raises up these overseers, then there will be men who emerge in the context of this local body who catch the members' attention, who catch the elders already in place, our attention, right? With leadership qualities that meet what the Bible is asking for. They will, in a sense, they will, in a sense, already be doing the work. Already following that giftedness that God has given them. They'll be the ones who talk to people and help people in the word of God. So, as they start to emerge, their gifts will be seen. This is the way the spirit of God brings people up, isn't it? I think we need to take it seriously enough to say that only men who are qualified and those who emerge are those who the Spirit of God has put forward. Okay, we need to trust the Lord. Let's be very careful not to preempt or circumvent that process. If we do, we're going to be in trouble. We will be. I'm sure that this church has made mistakes in the past when it comes to filling an office. I've made mistakes. I feel like I've made a few when it comes to the deacon body. Uh, not at this church because we presently don't have deacons actually function. We don't have the office as you would see the names of 15 men on a board. You understand? I know we have deacons who serve. Okay. We, meet, we need to be sensitive to what the Spirit of God is doing in our church. You on your end need to equally be serious about this. Right? When we put a man forward for the eldership or the diaconate. Deaconship, what do you want to say? You should desire to get to know that man that will be serving you. He will serve your family, right? Uh, this relationship will require submission and fellowship to his eldership. You're entrusting your life and your family to this individual. Now, question regarding that. Would you be okay if you were going to have heart surgery and your heart surgeon had on his wall a certificate from an automotive school? Would you? Oh, come on, Mary. You know full well. I know your dad's not going to like that, right? Uh, I want Andy Ellett to have all his credentials if he's putting me to sleep, right? And whoever's performing the surgery, you want them to have that particular degree. No matter how cheap they say they're going to do it, right? The issue is... Uh, I think we need to take this responsibility seriously. I'm trying to get you to understand that. Let's work together. Staff elders now, pastors, 
together with the congregation, to take it seriously so that to the best of our ability, as best we know how, that we have qualified and called men to the office of elder. Okay? Next time we're going to look at qualifications. All right?